Uh, well, good evening. So it's very nice to be here. It's a delight to introduce Father Hans. Father Hans and I have known each other for 10, 12 years, something like that. Yeah, I think I was in Ohio you know, 15. I don't remember where I was 15 years ago, but I'm sure it was exciting. Um, this last Sunday, we celebrated Father's Day in America. And um, just sort of a little an interesting fact. When um, Father's Day was first celebrated at the beginning of the 1900s, one in eight children was, were uh, raised in a home without a father. When we celebrated Father's Day this past Sunday, that number had risen to one in four. In the early 1900s, the reason that one in eight children were being raised in a fatherless home is because fathers uh, would frequently die, either through uh, natural causes, through illness, or through industrial accidents. Today, one in four children are raised in a fatherless household, not because of the death of the father, but because of this, the decision of adults. Adults choose to have children out of wedlock. Adults choose um, to end their marriages and to leave their children in fatherless homes. As it happened, I was raised by a, a single mom, so I'm not being judgmental or harsh. Uh, I think my mom and other single moms that I know can often uh, do heroic work. But the fact of the matter is, is that we still have increasing generate more and more boys every generation who are being raised without fathers. And that is simply not a good thing. It's bad for the culture, but it's also bad for the church. There was a time when if a young man's parents divorced, there was a hesitancy to admit him to seminary, much less to ordain him to the priesthood. The reason being that a man, young man raised without a father was thought to not necessarily have had the kind of education he needed in the home that would be necessary for the priesthood. So both culturally and personally, I think the work that Father Hans does with young men in his talk tonight is of immense importance. It's important not only for the culture and for the church, but it's also important for women. I'm a college chaplain, and I spend a lot of time talking not only to young men, but also to young women. And the fact of the matter is, if boys don't know how to be men, they don't know how to treat women. I have five sisters who I love and respect fiercely, and they have suffered greatly at the hands of men who were stupid. So this is a topic that's important for the culture, for the church, but for everyone here who has children, who have sons, who have daughters. So with that in mind, if you would please welcome Father Hans and give him your undivided attention. Thank you. Thank you, Father Gregory. Thank you, John. This is an Orthodox Christian gathering, so why don't we stand and we'll begin with prayer. Heavenly King, Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and feels all things, treasury of blessings, giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every stain of sin and save our souls, O gracious one. Amen. Let me put on my timer so I don't talk too long. All right, it's my pleasure to be here today at the inaugural event. That's an honor. And... Uh, I've looked forward to this for a long time, and uh, it's an occasion for me to actually bring out what I've been talking about here and there. I've talked publicly on it in informal situations, so this is a, a great opportunity to for clarify my thoughts and hopefully inspire others with some things that I have learned. I'm not going to talk about the cultural causes for our, of our crisis tonight. I'm just not. I'm going to talk about the pastoral dimension. Uh, we can talk about that in the questions if you'd like. Um, I'll give you my opinions. But we have Father Gregory here, too, and he studies this stuff. He really knows it. But there is a war in this culture, a great conflict about manhood and masculinity. Books have been written on it, The War on Boys, there's the attack on patriarchy. We're all aware of that. All this stuff resonates in the life of our young people, and it confuses 
boys, and I say it confuses men as well. And this, Father Gregory already touched on this, but this, this, this conflict is corroding our cultural structures, namely fatherhood and the family. I need not say anything more about that because Father Gregory already outlined that. But the struggle is this, and the focus of this, and the focus of my pastoral ministry in this dimension is that boys no longer know how to become men. I'm going to talk about that, but especially the men here, I want you to listen very closely. Because the things that the boys have to learn are things that men need to remember. Because manhood is not something that's, that, that stops, it's ever progressing. Fatherhood is a developmental process. And the truth is, for all men here present, we all need fathers. Our Lord in heaven, our God in heaven, is a father, our father. He's the ultimate one that we look to. I contend that all men need an older and mature and wiser and more experienced man above them because this emulation that is necessary to learn how to become not only a man, but a father is ongoing. So we'll speak of boys tonight, but what we're really speaking about is manhood and ultimately fatherhood. And what the boys have to learn, the men have to reinforce in their own lives over and over and over again. Patriarchy, properly understood, and it's under assault, is actually written into the very fabric of the creation. God is father. God is not mother. God is father. The motherhood is given to us by the Theotokos. That's where the female dimension comes in. But the world is, creation is fundamentally patriarchal. It is. And don't be ashamed of that. Don't be ashamed of that. Don't make excuses for that, but understand what it is. Here's my thesis, and I draw this thesis. I'm going to give you like four or five theses. I draw this from my experience in dealing with young men. Men learn how to become a man from other men. Father Gregory said women do heroic work, and they really do. But mothers cannot be fathers. Only men can be fathers, and boys learn how to become a man from other men, other men. And boys learn how to become a man when that, the other man is a father. See, boys have to be fathered into manhood. If they don't have that, they will go looking for a father. If they don't find a father, they will collectively join and raise themselves. We see that happening in the black community, for example, with the gangs. What are gangs? Gangs are really the, 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 the boys forming a family and some kind of hierarchical structure. Now, it's dysfunctional. Of course, it's dysfunctional. Boys can't raise boys. But the need for the father is innate. It's absolutely innate. And we all need it no matter how old we might be. That's why we look ultimately to heaven and we call God, our creator, Father. Now, my mentoring of young men started about eight years ago or so in earnest. But I've actually been doing it a, a long time before then, but it's like in the last eight years, and it's probably a function of my own age, a lot of things started crystallizing. And uh, the ministry really started to flourish. So let me tell you a little bit about myself so you know um, the well I'm drawing from. I've been a priest for 28 years this Sunday. So this Sunday is my 28th anniversary of my priesthood. I worked in the church as a youth director and a lay assistant for five years before my ordination. I've served in the GOA for 25 years, counting the five, as a lay assistant. And now I serve in the Antiochian diocese and have been there for about eight years. I've always had a heart for young people. I learned this when I started doing youth work. I really loved it. And I learned a lot about how to teach kids. And I learned a lot about how to communicate. 
If you can, if you can explain a concept to a 15-year-old and he gets it, you can explain it to an adult. They'll get it too. That's what I've learned. And just working with those kids over the five years and bringing concepts down to earth was a good thing. It was like a basic training. It makes sermons comprehensible, for example. But I also saw something that uh, alarmed me at first. It shouldn't have, because I was aware of the culture around me, but it did. The first generation of kids I had, I had about three generations, and I call generation in this context six years, from sixth grade to 12. Okay, and I did about, I did about, um, um, oh, I'd say three cycles of that, not solely in my first church, but through camp programs and this and that, which I was very involved in. The first generation, that was 1990, and, and earlier, probably 87 to 92. They still knew right from wrong, okay? The kids would mess up, especially the guys. And I go, come on, guys, what are you doing? And they go, yeah, Father, we get it, we get it, we get it. And they would change their behavior. The next generation still had that sense, but they challenged me. And they say, why is it wrong for people to have sex if they love each other? Those challenges came from kids in the church. Good Greek Orthodox parents. They were in church every Sunday. The kids did Sunday school. They were in Goya. They did everything. They went to summer camp. But the challenges came from them. And that showed me that the cultural rot of the 60s, and I don't have much good to say about the 60s, the cultural rot of the 60s was really sinking in deep. It was. Now, this was almost 30 years ago, all right? The third generation was really alarming because here I was talking to the kids, and uh, this was actually, I was in Atlanta at the time. It was a big conference, and I was talking to the kids, and sometimes your hearing gets acute so you can hear a particular thing. And there was a kid in the front row, and I really liked this kid. He was a senior in high school, sharp kid, you know, knew his parents. I mean, picture perfect, all right? And I hear him whisper to his friends, he's speaking in absolutist terms. It shocked me when I heard that. It absolutely shocked me because I understood the content of, the, of, of that that phrase, and it meant this, that the relativism, the moral relativism of the culture had reached so deep that even the priest had no authority anymore, none. So in other words, my words did not carry any truth, any authority by virtue of my priesthood. See, in fact, it was dismissed because I was speaking in absolutist terms. A thou shalt not, in other words, is no longer a thou shalt not. It's only a thou shalt not if I consider it such. And this thinking had permeated the minds and the hearts of our young people in our churches, and they were completely acculturated, and in their minds, unbeknownst to them, they were leaving the Orthodox faith. Now, I thought about that a lot. Like I said, it, it shocked me. It really shocked me that this kid, because I like this kid, had a good relationship with him, said that. And so I realized I have to change. I have to change my approach. And I did. And I thought, OK, how am I going to change it? I thought, I'm going to go back to Genesis. See, my job in the. Uh, camp programs and everything like that. My job was, now, I'm giving you priest talk here. My job was the sex talk. I'm not only talking about sexuality, all right? I'm talking about inner moral development. But my job was the sex talk because no other priest wanted to talk about it or knew how to talk about it. Well, I knew how to talk about it. But you have to understand, it wasn't about sex. It was about inner moral development. And moral development, inner moral development, is not moralisms. It's the integration of the human person on the inside. 
But if I no longer had authority by virtue of my priesthood, how could I reach them? So I started in Genesis. And I looked at what the Lord said we are created to be. And the, and the scripture has authority, not only by virtue of the fact that it, it, the, the verses are in scripture, but that the verses in scripture come ultimately from the very mouth of God, they do, through the mouth of the author of the particular book, and that those words would resonate in the heart for anyone who has ears to hear. And so that's what I started doing. I, instead of <clears throat> talking about morality, I started talking about Genesis. And I learned a lot from their reaction to my presentation. And I found out it worked. So I laid out first what a human being is what God's intention for the human being was, where he went wrong. And these words resonate with the very structure of the soul because we are created by God and because God desires our salvation and we understand salvation as interior healing, the healing of the soul ultimately. Because the healing of the soul is what enables that deeper communion with God. And when we have deeper communion with God, and this was my great discovery, we also increase in self-knowledge. And this became the foundation of the work from then after. Now I said things really began to change about seven or eight years ago. How did they change? Young men just started entering my life. They did. Um, through various circumstances initially, but then word of mouth. And people call me up now. Young men who are in trouble. They call me up. And, and out of that, my work has sharpened. My focus has gotten better. And these are things I've learned subsequently. Boys want to become men. Every boy wants that. Who am I? What am I put on this world to do? How am I a man? Now, they will not articulate it in that way. Some of them are very fearful. And don't even want to do it. But deep down, that is the driving energy and intent of the soul. They want that. And when you begin to speak to them about that, if they're not in rebellion, if sometimes even if they're in rebellion, you call them on their rebellion and their defiance. They want that too sometimes. But if you begin to speak to them about that, they drink it in like water. Another point, boys are ravaged by the sexual promiscuity of the culture. And so are women. But I'm talking about boys tonight. The sexual promiscuity in the culture is devastating to our young people. But they grow up in a world where any type, any type of restraint, we're going to talk about this in a little, little, in detail a little farther in the lecture, but any type of restraint, it's, it's just not part of the popular consciousness anymore. It's not. They grow up into a very promiscuous culture and they believe that, okay, I have to be promiscuous. Everybody else is. Does it violate their conscience? Does it hurt their soul? Absolutely. But there's nobody telling them, don't do this. And the no, there's nobody telling them why you should not. Hang on to that thought because there's a solution to that that will absolutely blow your mind. All boys are seriously hurt by divorce. All boys are seriously hurt by divorce. Now, can it be healed? Yes. Yes, it can. That which is, is lacking can be made up. 
Okay, but it's made up in different ways. When a divorce happens, and I'm not wagging my finger, I'm not a moralistic shaming, shamer at all, but understand that, that all children are damaged, but especially boys, they lose their way. Boys are very confused by the cultural assault on masculinity. They're boys. They're made to be men. But the assault is so great, and they don't listen to the arguments and conceptualize it, but they take in the ethos of the dominant culture. And I'm telling you, our church is not, in its present constitution, strong enough to resist that. It's not. This stuff, this stuff permeates their very life, and it permeates their thinking, and I see that over and over um, in my experience with them. All boys long for a father. All boys long for a father. And the boys who don't have a father, other men can fill that gap. Other men can fill that gap. Now, I mentioned that patriarch is written into the very fabric of creation, and it is men are born to lead. They are. And men aspire to that. And men aspire to success. And men aspire to doing something significant, significant in their lives. We all do, men. You know that. You know, I remember when we were younger, and, and every boy has this, you know, you have these rescue fantasies. Somebody, you know, a car drives off the bridge, and you jump in, and you save the person. It's very male. It's very, very men. Boys play that way, and men think that way. But it's still, I don't care how old we are, it's still in us. We want to do something significant in the world, not for our own glory, but because we posit our own manhood by doing that. And in doing those things, whatever they are, you know, it's not stuff that makes the news. It's stuff that's significant and makes a difference. Also brings us meaning and joy. It's the way we're constituted. It's the way we're made. Now, here we're going to jump into theology a little bit, but I promised John, actually John told me, no speculative theology. Where are you, John? Yeah, no speculative theology and no church history. And it's not going to be any speculative theology, and it's not going to be any church history. But it is going to be something that's fundamental to all of us that when discovered by the boy becomes transformative in his life. Movement towards Christ affects a corresponding increase in self-knowledge. Now, what do you mean by that, Father? I mean, the more you grow, you, you move towards Christ and you conform your life to what he wants your life to be, the more you begin to understand who you are. Follow that? Moving to Christ is not, it's not a metaphor. It's concrete. And so is the knowledge that we receive from him about ourselves. Manhood, in other words, and personhood, I include the women here too, is grounded in our communion with our Savior. So the deeper our communion increases with our Savior, the more grounded we become in our own humanity. And that groundedness is personal. We get to know who our Savior is, and he gets to know us. That's different than knowing about us or knowing who we are. Knowing us as, and we know him, that's relational. And that in that relationship, he gives us his life. And his life grounds us more in our very own being, in the who of who we are, because we were created to live with him. That's how it works. How do I explain this to a 16-year-old or 15-year-old? This is how I do it. 
I get a flower with a bud. Think of a tulip, a tulip that has not come into bloom. And then I pick up a, a tulip that is blooming. I say, this is who we are. This is who Christ wants you to be. The only way we can come from this point to this, if we live in the light of the sun, the very spirit of God, and they get it, it resonates with their soul because it's the truth. Now, it works in the other direction, too. If a man desires to know himself, guess what? God becomes part of the equation. We're talking about, and I'm going to give you a $35 word here, ontological reality. In other words, that's just the way it's made, and it's not going to change because that's the way God made it. Ontological. It's in the very structure of creation, which means also the very structure of your soul, because even though your soul is eternal, it is created. That's why these words that I'm saying to you tonight ring true. St. Paul says, I pray that you come to the visions and revelations of the knowledge of God unto mature manhood, the measure of of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Manhood is only found in communion with the Father. Second thesis, our Lord desires our salvation. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. The Lord stops at nothing to save us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He stops at nothing. The arm of the Lord is never shortened. He does everything he can to bring us to him and to give us his life. And that's really true. It's true for everyone. But I see it so clearly in the lives of these young men. I said earlier, and I'm going to repeat it again, salvation is not a metaphor. Salvation is concrete experience. Given the state of our cultural decay and it's rotting at its core, we need to change it, just like the early church did. But it's rotting at its core I think that the renewal, the salvation of these young men and the renewal of manhood has to begin in the church. Now, so I said that these guys come to me, and they do come to me. I have five guys in my church, and they just came in off the street. Off the street, all right? I never met these guys before. They're not related to anybody in my church, but here they are, and they're there every Sunday. And they come with the baggage that a lot of young men today have the pain, the hurt, the misconceptions, but they come there every Sunday. In fact, they get there on time. One guy rides his bike. He's 15 years old. Another guy comes on his skateboard, right? And they're there every single Sunday. One guy's married, and, and they're going to have a baby. And he went from church to church, and he just, you, they knew they needed God. None of them have any religious background at all. They were not raised as Christians. And the one guy, the couple, um, you know, went to the Baptist church, but didn't work out. Went to this church, that church. Finally, they got frustrated and quit going, and they started searching on YouTube, and they found out about orthodoxy, Right? And then they found out there was an Orthodox church nearby. It was my church. They found my website, and they came. And they keep coming. They keep coming. This is what's happening. And so I work with them, but I also work with a lot of other guys over the phone now. You know, the word gets out, and people struggle. And 
it's gone from, you know, the youngest is 15 years old, but the oldest is 35, 37, somewhere right in there, right? And these, the, 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 the harm of the cultural dissolution is really mind-boggling once you see it in the lives of real people. And conversely, the power of God to bring healing is absolutely remarkable. That's why I can say with all confidence that God desires our salvation, because I see it in the lives of these men. So they come in, and the people I talk to, what do we do first? And this is not necessarily in, in order, but this stuff has to happen, and it applies to all of us too. Confession. The sins have to come out. The sins have to come out. you got to go to confession. You have to. Because if the sins don't come out, the possibility for the healing of the soul is truncated. That's why. Now, also, confession is a way to release pain. And especially important, confession is a way to release shame. Because even though people sin, and sometimes they sin ignorantly, and in many cases these guys have, sin still can bring on a sense of shame because sin is a violation of, of, of your inner structure and your inner being. Sin is not just merely a breaking of a commandment. Sin is the loss of life. Sin leaves... Sin leaves has an effect that it leaves in the person that needs to be cleansed through confession. But the cleansing is a, isn't a forensic legal cleansing. It's a cleansing and healing of the soul. So confession then becomes absolutely necessary because without it, the opportunity for the healing can't take place. And there have been some remarkable confessions where, where it's really quite profound. They, they transform me, hearing them and watching them, where the pain comes out, the shame is lifted, and the transformation occurs. Also, confession is kind of a road map of the soul, too. It's kind of a map of the soul. And so when someone confesses to you something, they, they, you, you see what they're really struggling with. Because a confession is also a revelation that I'm weak in this area and I need help. And if you're a father, you love your children, you're going to help them. That's what our Heavenly Father does to us. Second thing, they have to learn, men listen up, because it applies to every single one of us who live in this culture. We have to learn chastity. We have to learn chastity. This culture is so preoccupied with sexuality, and the reason it's preoccupied with sexuality is because in leaving God, man becomes estranged from both himself and other, and then sexuality becomes a false spirituality to try and restore that communion. That's the energy behind it. But that attempt to restore communion, that false spir spirituality in the end, merely deepens the estrangement. It's a vicious circle. And as I said, you know, sin harms the soul. And a lot of these guys have been seriously harmed by the promiscuity, by sexual sins. That's what I meant early, earlier when I talk about the moral development of the person. It's not a moralistic shaming. You did this, God is angry. We're orthodox. We don't think that way. Don't do that, my son, because you harm your soul and you estrange yourself from God, from other people, and from yourself. But turn it around, turn it around, and the estrangement will be healed and you will have union with God and other people in the way 
that it was created to be. Now, here's the remarkable thing about that. In the struggle to live a life of, ch of chastity and sexual purity, something happens. And here's where I see God really working. The natural creative energy that all men possess in, has been, in the promiscuity, dissipated in, in unchastity. So the porn use, the, the chronic masturbation, the fornication, I'm using scriptural language here, you know, all that stuff. You know what happens to a man? You know why the estrangement with himself happens? Because his natural creative energy is being dissipated. He's throwing it away. Now, a young man doesn't understand this because he's coming, he's growing up into a world that encourages that dissipation. And he doesn't understand why he's weak. He doesn't understand why he has the problems that he does. But once he begins a life of chastity, that energy that was dissipated finds its natural channels and he begins to flourish. Think about that. And that's true of all of us. If there's sexual sins in our life, we got to clean that up. We got to clean that up. But in the cleaning up of it, you'll find your strength increasing as well. That's what will happen. And the role of the spiritual father in that process then, because as a young man, is to tell him, you're good at this. You should try that. I see you have this particular talent. And the energy then becomes directed in ways congruent with his personality, and he begins to experience the first taste of success. And men love success. Because men do things like build bridges and skyscrapers. All right? We dam rivers, and we design cars. That's what we do. And we love doing it. And the reason we love doing it is because we were created to do those kind of things. When a man because of the culture, what happens a lot of times is that a person will have an impulse and they'll go right from the impulse to the action. And it becomes habituated. Okay? It becomes habituated. That habit has to be broken. How's it broken? It's, it's broken by assuming a life of chastity, straightening out this part of our lives, and this is what I teach them, and creating a space between the impulse and the action. When there's a space created, because they're starting to resist now, when there's a space created, you create the space where God can act. And he does. He does. I see this over and over and over again. Because the Lord desires nothing more than, than the healing of these boys so that they can become men. And if he remains faithful, and many of them do. I mean, porn can be overcome. It really can. I've seen it. If he remains faithful... And he has that first flush of success, that power that he feels when the energy, the masculine energy that was dissipated, actually start flowing in its proper channels, the moral logic of what I teach becomes self-evident. They get it. They get it. And they like it because they like being whole. They like seeing progress. Our culture is very, very sick. And I'm not talking much about the culture tonight because I've warred against the culture before, but nobody listens. I find it more effective now to uh, work with people one-on-one -on -one because, because you really can affect some positive change. Now... Speaking of sexual promiscuity, and I know I'm talking to all the men here because the truth of the matter is 
almost every man born after 960, 1960 has been bitten by this viper. We have. We've all struggled with this, right? So if we're going to help young men, we've got to struggle with our own passions as well. And we've got to overcome them. There's also, third, a spiritual vocational dimension to this and their healing and what we have to do for them. I've already touched on that with the redirection of the energy, but that has, that's a really important part of it. They don't know who they are, okay? They don't know who they are because they're growing up in an age where, where a lot of the experiences that they needed to have growing up have been thwarted for those reasons I have outlined before. So the father, I'm repeating myself here, the father is the one who teaches them. That's what fathers do. I, I love my sons, and I want to see them prosper. And I want to see them prosper in all ways. I want to see them prosper in their interior lives. I want to see them prosper in their vocations. If some decide to go to college, I want to see them prosper in, their, in college. But I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, they do. This works. I could tell you some really astounding stories, but I have a rule never to tell personal stories. Okay, this is absolutely private. But I, and I'm just not going to do that because I don't want to violate their privacy. But it's, it's astounding to me what I have seen. And I reiterate, this is what has shown me that the boys want to become men. And God is very, very powerful on their behalf. Now, not having any spiritual grounding, any spiritual background, you might wonder, well, how does trust establish? I learned this too. I learned by experience. That's how I learned. I pray with them. And here's what happens. And this surprised me first when it happened, because I didn't know it would, but it surprised me. But now it is so consistent, I know it's going to happen every single time. And it sounds presumptuous of me to say this about God, but I can say this because I've seen it, and it also confirms how much he loves them. Every time I pray with them, they feel God. God comes to them in the prayer. They feel the presence of God, and they want to pray. They say, Father, can we pray? Uh, yeah. I go, yeah, sure, we'll pray, because they feel the presence of God, and the presence of God is always a deep fatherly assurance. But because it happens in the context of, of, of the prayer, and I do the praying because they don't know how to pray. They learn by modeling me, all right? I do the praying. They don't pray. I say, I'm going to say the prayer. They're actually kind of relieved by that, but at the same time, of course they are. But at the same time, you know, they learn how to pray. Um, because they experience the presence of God in the context of the prayer, they also trust me because I'm there when it happens. And that's always the beginning of the foundation of the relationship. So, um, John, I think a little over time, I'm sorry, a little over time. It's, a, it's, a, it's an occupational hazard, John, I apologize. Wow. But I, I hope I feel the charge to be practical, concrete, and not theoretical. All right, any questions, discussions? Wait for the microphone to come down if you would, please. And speak into it. Father, thanks very much. Very thought-provoking, very insightful. Um, just from my own experience, I, I know me personally when I was growing up, and I'm, I'm an older guy, so I'm pre-1960. Okay. <laughs> when did you uh, come of age, though? 50s or 60s? Oh, 60s, yeah. You're a 60s child. I'm a 60s. Well, yeah, you know, you yeah. get a young adulthood and everything. All right. So I guess my, I know when I was growing up at that age, uh, yes, you want to become a man. The question is, what is a man? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so society has all of these icons for you to look at. You know, John Wayne, right? A number of different masculine types. Yeah. 
for the Greeks is Anthony Quinn, right? There's a man, right? Mm -hmm. And so these are the types. Right. They're wrong. They're wrong. I don't believe those are the types that we should have our children, our boys, model after. Mm -hmm. There are some attributes there that are good. I think the the icon that we need to look at is Christ himself because he came as not only our savior but as our great teacher mm -hmm. and he talked to us about the things that are important for our salvation things like humility right. this introspection and reevaluation of yourself and where are you going and all of that sort of thing not to be um, offended when somebody slights you all those are not considered to be qualities of a man from society's point of view. Yes, but if a, if a guy was sitting here listening to you, he would listen to you, okay? But the real influence in his life is you because you're telling him about this stuff, okay? He's listening to you. And if you have a relationship with him as a father, he will believe what you say because you're his father. He's not going to grasp the concepts you're talking about. He's not. He's going to relate to the personal dimension of you caring for him and teaching him. That's really how it works. And so when that, when that lacks, then we people look into the culture. And all that, anyway, is just marketing. It's just marketing. And... I mean, I think it's kind of diabolical because I think sometimes I look, the marketing is so slick that there's psychologists behind that marketing feeding that void in order to sell products. I'm not cynical. That's what I think is really going on. But what we have to remember, it's the face-to-face, -face, personal, person-to-person -person communion that has the effect. And if you go and you tell a son, these guys are not really models, right? And he loves you, and he trusts you. He believes you just because you love him and are willing to teach him. See what I mean? So that's how we also, that's how we also at the same time negate the effects of the dominant culture. I interrupted you. I'm sorry about no, that. No, thank you, Father. That's, that's good. I think that's how we're we all it. a work in progress, right? Everybody is a work in progress, and that's our whole spiritual life is just continual development. Towards yeah, and it, this is going to sound like a negation, but it's not. Yeah, we're all works in progress. We have to know what the progress is, <laughs> and we have to know where we're going and how to get there. So, yeah, we are yeah. all works in progress. That's why no matter how old you are, the need for a father never diminishes. But there is, there is, in a sense, a science to this. There really is. It works in a certain way because the Lord himself is consists, consistent, and we are structured interiorly in a certain way. So it's really important that we begin to comprehend and practice how it works and how it's done. That's not a negation to what you're saying. It's an expansion on what you're saying. And that's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do. And and hopefully have done that to some extent tonight. Thank you, Father. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Father. Um, I have a question. I have a daughter with three children, one uh, young boy, and I try to fill the role as a father. He doesn't have a father. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, well, boo, you're not my dad. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to fill that void and listen to you. How do, how do you do that? You say, I'm your granddad. So I don't try to fill a void of him seeing or wanting a father. No, you see, you are his father. You're his grandfather. You're his papu. And you say, I'm not your dad, but I'm your granddad. I'm your papu. I'm still your father. Because you are. Okay. So you respond to him in the fatherly ways that are appropriate, and he will see that because his need for a father will be fulfilled. See, this is one of the beautiful things about extended families. When divorce happens, and it does, or somebody dies and that happens, other men can step in and fill the void, 
And because there's a male presence, a strong male presence in the life of the boy, um, the deficit will not be debilitating. That's your role. Okay, you don't wait to get approval for the role from your grandson. He's your grandson. Okay, discussion closed. So he says, I'm not your father, but he's going to figure out you're his grandfather because you're going to be his grandfather, and his grandfather is going to be his father. Again, I've, I've, seen this, I've seen this in other Greek Orthodox families, and it's that, I think, you know, we don't have extended families anymore, but I think that that was how these problems in earlier times were ameliorated. Another man would step in, an uncle, a grandfather. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're, you are his father, you're his grandfather. So, so be the father and understand that the son is working some things out, but you don't wait for his, his approval before you do it. You do it anyway. It's written into the fabric of creation. And God will guide you, and God will bless you, because you've got, you've got a beautiful little boy here who needs guidance. Who else is going to guide him? Any other questions? Any discussions, Sam? Uh, thanks for your talk, Father Hans. Um, one thing that I'm always curious about is uh, domains where um, boys can practice manhood, you know, like, or domains that have certain challenges or duties or whatever that they come back to over and over to challenge themselves and get some kind of mastery. And if this one isn't working out, maybe it can be over here. Um, I think, you know, sex is an obvious one. Work is another one. Like work is men, big. men need jobs. We get a certain sense of duty about this that we, you know, is no. almost, uh, you know, it strikes maybe other people outside the culture as obsessive, you know, but I'm curious, what are some of the, domains that masculinity needs to get some mastery over, you know, conversation well, or, uh, I don't here, know. Here's what I counsel young men in their early 20s. I said, don't even worry, don't even, don't even think about a relationship. I tell them that. Don't think about it. Because why are you going to go into a relationship with somebody that you're not going to marry? Okay? It's just going to end up bad. It is. Right? You can you can you can have friendships, but at that age, you know, go out with the guys, go out with the group. And a lot of them are relieved to hear that. Your focus in your early 20s is yourself. You have to, you have to work and you have to excel at your work. And I tell them, you have to excel at your work. Now, what that work is has to be something that fits who they are, and we work that out. But they do excel. And don't get tied up in a relationship. Sex is for marriage. If you're going to live a chaste life, if you want to live, I call it the higher level. If you want to live on the higher level, and it is a higher level, and they discover this higher level, this focusing, the directing of their energy, they love living there. They really do then you're not going to enter into a relationship until you get married. And they understand the logic of it. They really do. Now, do they, they battle, you know, sometimes they get a little lonely. You know, I said, well, we've got to convert the loneliness into solitude. That's what we've got to do. So the domain of man at that age, and I, I think all of our ages, is work. We men need to work, and we need to do well at our work. And when we do well at our work, you know, it, it, it strengthens us on the inside. It just does. The sex, the relationship, sex is for marriage. We're talking about living a chaste life. But a chaste life is the only way that you can reach that higher level. That's one of the beauties of chastity is the focusing 
it allows and the creativity it unleashes and, and, and subsequently the success a person might have. And so, your question, Sam, is the first focus of man is, is on his work. That's really it. And, and, and when that is established, especially a young man, when that is established, then, uh, you know, we'll deal with the other things. When the time is right and when a person's ready for it. I have a quick question. If, if we're all... Oh, there done. you are. Yep. Okay. I was right. looking, looking yeah, holding the microphone so yeah, I have an yeah. advantage. Um, how can couples help each other in this scenario? And I'll just give my example. I've only got a daughter, and I was often told she's a girl. You know, yeah. so I, I was not, you know, I was, I had my fatherly duties, and my wife did what was needed for my daughter. How would, say, a wife talk to her husband who maybe isn't doing the fatherly thing for their son? Well, um, that's a tough one. Um, that's really about marriage counseling, <laughs> okay? Um, I've told couples, I'm not a marriage counselor. I'm just not. I don't have the patience for it. So I'm really good at diagnosing things, but I'm not good at working through it with people. So I find somebody who is, and I let them do it. But I have told guys, you got to man up. I have. I'm not afraid to do that. If I see that a, a guy's slacking, he knows he's slacking. All guys know when they slack. And I will go to him and say, you just, you just got to man up. You're not doing what you should be doing and what you're supposed to be doing. And sometimes they, sometimes they do. I've, I've told women as well, stop nagging him. Because because you nag, you nag your husband, I tell you, he goes nuts. He's going to shut you out. Guys can't take it. They can't take it. And if, I mean, wives, if you're nagging your husband, I'll tell you what he's going to do. He's going to retreat into his cave, and he's going to stay there. And you're going to feel abandoned, and you're going to nag him more, and he's going to bury himself in his cave more. Because to him... To him, the nagging is emasculation, and men can't handle emasculation. They can't, and they cannot handle emasculation from a woman. They just can't. They constitutionally can't, because you're asking them to hand over their manhood to you, and they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it, and those men who do the women end up becoming so angry because of it. So the man has to nag, has to man up, and the woman has to quit nagging, okay? That's my analysis. How you're going to work it out, you have to go to a professional, okay? Because they understand the intricacies better than I do. And I work with, I work with, with young men. That's what I understand. And... Uh, the other stuff is just not in my bailiwick. <laughs> it's not. And, but speaking of, of daughters, I have a daughter. That mother-daughter bond is one of the deepest mysteries of the universe. It just is. And if you're the dad, I tell you, you're not going to penetrate it. You're not even going to understand it. But take care of your wife, right? Take care of your wife, and your daughter will feel secure. That's the main thing. Hey, Father. Um, are our local priests, and this is kind of a general question, are our local priests able to handle these type of issues? It's a little louder. Are our local priests able to handle these type of issues? And if they are not, where does a family go? Well, I don't, I, don't think, I don't see a lot of teaching happening from above to local priests no. about these kind of social issues. And how do they handle that um, when families have issues? And if they don't... Um, if they don't feel like they're getting good advice, where do they go then? I don't know the answer to that yet. And what I'm hoping 
is, and that's why, why I said at the outset that this is kind of, I've had a couple of, I've had a couple of, um, what do they call it, pre-grand openings, but this is the grand opening. I really hope I can teach other priests this. That's what I hope. Uh, priests don't know how to do it. Okay, a lot of people don't know how to do it. I'm, I'm blessed because it just kind of happened and I was awake and I pray a lot and the Lord teaches me things and so do those boys, right? But it's not that hard. It's not that hard. And, and I think other people can learn it and I would love to have the opportunity to teach other people how to do it. You know, um, you got to pray. I pray for these guys every single day, all right? You've got to be quoting the Apostle Paul, you know, ready in season and out of season. That's what priests do, right? If a priest complains, I tell the priest, man up. What do you think you signed up for, right? But that's what I would like to do, and that's how I hope at least in some way to to start addressing the deficit that exists that you pointed out in your question. Thank you, Father. Um, I didn't hear anything about video games. Have you encountered any young men who are just stuck in the basement doing video games? Well, it's an inebriation, okay? It's an inebriation is what it is. And um, some men don't want to break from it. Porn, video games, compulsive masturbation. It's all, it's all part of the dysfunction. It's the loss of manhood. The loss of the sense of a guy's own manhood. And so, you know, that, that brings sorrow to the soul. Um, and he doesn't know how to get out of it. Right? And so he inebriates... He inebriates himself, is what he does. You know, inebriation is just, um, it, it's just, a lot of times it's a drowning of, sorrow, of shame, sorrow, sadness, and pain. That's what it is. Now, he might need a kick in the butt, all right, but that's not going to help him without the things I described. He needs a father, all right? He does. But not all men respond. I had a guy call me up, and he, he uh, this story I'll tell, and he really wanted to be a rescue, a rescue diver in the Coast Guard. And that was, that's what he was born to do. And listening to him, I could see it. But he was 24, and the window was closing, because they don't take anybody after 30, I think. And you have to have a college degree. And he had two years of college left. He was kind of a slacker, frankly. But I don't know where he got my number, but he got it somewhere and he called me up. And so we met. We went to Starbucks. And I said, you can really do this. I mean, the window has not closed. You're really going to have to focus on school for the next two years. We looked at the logistics of it. You know, his parents were paying for school, so that wasn't an issue. I said, you're going to have to work hard. You're going to have to study hard. And you're going to have to clean up your life. If you're willing to do that, you'll succeed but he wasn't willing to give up the porn in the end. He just was not willing to give up the porn. So, you know, he drifted away from me, right? And so, I mean, sometimes, sometimes people don't respond. There's nothing you can do about that, right? So, I mean, if the guy is, is locking himself up in the, in the basement, someone's got to talk to the guy and say, this is what you need to do. If he doesn't respond, he doesn't respond. You know, the Lord is not coercive, doesn't do anything against our will. I deal with the people who are stuck but don't know how to get out. All right, we have one more question right here. Hi, Father. So how do we bring our boys or our men back to church? Oh, you bring your boys back to church? Um, how old are they? Well, they range anywhere from teenagers to college. Yeah, see. Um, 
I always used to do it through camp because camp is where, where, where the, the, the real meaningful experiences can happen if you structure it right and then you take that energy from camp and then you bring it into Goya and into church. You also need to um, bring these kids into an understanding of the liturgical dimension of church which is to say you have to introduce them to the very sacred dimension of life. There's, there's, you know, there's different ways you can do this. Um, the way I, I always did it in Goya. I mean, my, my Goya program really flourished, but it took three years to build. I mean, my first two years, I was lucky to have three or four people there. And eventually, after three years, it, it popped to 35, 40 kids. And... Uh, you know, when I was in St. Catharines, I had 90% uh, attendance of all the kids in the parish. And we, we would do things. That sacred dimension is really important. They have to feel God. They have to experience God. Okay? And it's not enough to tell them about God. They don't, they don't get it. They have to experience God. And once that experience happens, then the concepts start making sense. But you can't conceptualize a person into an encounter with God. Okay, it doesn't work. And, I mean, one thing I always used to do at, at the end of my, this doesn't really answer your question, but this is the direction we have to move. At the end of my Goya meetings, we would always go into the church and we'd sit on a semicircle in the soleil and I would bring in a bowl. And, and of course, you give these jobs to guys. You take care of the bowl. You take care of the candle. The candles, right? And, and uh, bring a bowl with sand in there, and, and, and we'd sit around and we would pray. And it would be the simplest prayers, and nobody had to pray. You could say pass, but everybody still had to light a candle. But you talk to them and see the presence of God is in the church. If you go to the, in the church, check this out. Go in there during the weekday when there isn't the commotion of a Sunday. You'll feel his presence. God lives in the church. And you'd calm them down and they would feel his presence and these would be the transformative experiences and this is what would keep them in the church. Another thing I always did was, I never had altar boy teams. I always, any kid who wanted to serve got to serve and if you want to serve every Sunday, you served every Sunday. Because boys have to do stuff. You gotta stick something in their hand and you gotta tell them to march. They love that stuff, right? They don't do well in pews. So when I was at St. Catharines, there were Sundays I had 25 altar boys. At Philopticos, keep buying them altar boy robes. But they were there. And I always knew if I could keep them from, from 11 to 13 years old, I had them until they were 18. It's, it's not rocket science, right? There has, to be, there has to be a concerted effort towards the youth but it can't be projects and programs, ski trips. Ski trips are fun. All that stuff is fun. I used to like all that stuff. I'm too old now. But I used to really like that stuff. And, but that's not what keeps them in church. What keeps them in, in church is concrete experience with Christ. That's what keeps them in church. And then when they drift, though, and sometimes they do, right, they still know where home is. And I knew that some would drift, and they did, but they came back home. Right? If they know this is home, that this is where they felt God, this is where they felt love, right? then when they need God again, that's where they'll go. That's what our focus has to be. Now, those kids, i got to tell you, have all grown up now. Those kids I talked about in the first three generations, they have kids of their own, and they're all in church. And they bring their kids to church, and they're all involved in the camp program now. The camp program's still going very, very strong. That's how we do it. You start with what you have. Okay, you start with what you have. And how to bring them back. I don't know how to bring them back, but pray very hard, okay? Because there has to be something in the church worth coming 
back to. Understand, and this doesn't, this is a, a, a general answer to your question. It's not an answer, it's a general observation to their question. The culture has changed, has really changed. And our commitment to Christ has to deepen. We are entering, we are entering an era that if, if, if the culture continues its trajectory, we will be cultural outcasts. Are you ready for that? If the culture continues its trajectory, we will be cultural outcasts, which means that our faith has to deepen. It will be like the early church with this difference. The early church was a transition from paganism into Christianity. This is living in a post-Christian culture. And it'll be hard, but that's where we're headed. So our faith has to deepen. Cultural Christianity is not sufficient anymore, as good as it was. And there's a lot of good to it, but it's, it's not sufficient anymore. The faith has to be, has to be the faith of, I'm going to say the saints and the healing that they bring into the world. That kind of power, that kind of dynamism. That has to be, that has to be more common for us. It's the only way. It's the only way that, that those who live in the culture will be reached. So it's, I understand. I wish I had a, a, an answer to your question. I don't have an answer to your question because there's no, single, there's no single answer to it. There's no process answer to it. Those days are done. The only thing that will draw them back ultimately is a more vibrant faith in our own hearts and in our own churches. Because a lot of our churches don't really reflect the depth of Christ that they should. You know, I don't know. I mean, these days, myself, I, I think ministry for a lot of priests, and I know these two men, and I think they would agree with me, really is rescuing people that are about to fall off the edge. Because that's where our kids are going to be too, you know. Don't be fooled. One more generation, that's where our, our own kids will be too. Unless the, the, the flame of faith burns more brightly in our own heart. I'm going to close with this because never, ever, ever underestimate the power of prayer, ever. So bring these things into prayer first. That's where it starts. We need new ways of doing things, but those ways are not in our toolbox. They have to be created. So we need to learn, we need to listen to the Lord more. We need to be more aware of the Spirit of God. We need to be more creative. And we need to say no to nonsense. We do. We have to say no to nonsense, or you will lose your church. And if you lose your church, you'll lose your kids. Now, I don't have a plan on how to do that, but I do have the example of my life, and because I've done that, this ministry has grown, and I have been able to pull guys off the edge of the cliff. I really have. These guys would have been lost. You know, some are in college now. And, and they, you know, to, 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 to see someone find themselves and this is what we do, is when we bring Christ to people, as they find themselves, the angels in heaven rejoice over that. 
And that's what our churches are supposed to be too. They really are. It begins though, it begins with prayer. Um, it begins with prayer. And don't forget that you don't require a majority. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. This is true in churches especially. That if there are a handful of faithful people, it can change. And often it does. It really does. If a handful of faithful people, which is to say that they see Christ and that they pray and they do their own stuff inside, right? That handful can change the very character and trajectory of a parish. It's not majority. Don't, don't think you need a majority. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. That's all the Lord needs to work. And he'll bring that creativity that we need to address the problems that you've described to us. Actually, what happens is he'll, he'll, loose, he'll release our nascent creativity because we're his, we're his <clears throat> arms and his legs, aren't we, in the church? Don't we do the work under his direction? Yes, we do. The Lord loves your children, okay? And you know who responds, who responds like with, with just a full outpouring of compassion, mercy, and power to those kind of prayers? The Theotokos, because she's a mother, all right? And you ask her, talk to your son. And she will, and you'll see responses. That I know, because I prayed with parents who have the same sorrow you do. And the Theotokos responds, that I know. So my answer to your question is start there. Start there and be very open to how God might be leading you. Because something new might be born out of that that'll be fruitful for the next generation. That's how it works. I believe in concrete Christianity. That's how it works. Do you believe me? Do you? Okay, do it then. Just do it. And, 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 and just see. See if something doesn't change for you.